When you use that, you're automatically leveraging the best practices of everything that everyone's learned in the past. to go to market excellence. I'm here with Daryl Alfonso today. Daryl is global marketing operations manager at Amazon Web Services. He's also an advisor for Sincari, and he previously held marketing leadership positions at Leaf Group, American Marketing Association, and Hitwise. Daryl, uh, welcome to the show. So glad to have you today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Dan. Really excited to be here and excited about this conversation. Well, uh, my Friday started off good because every Friday uh, you post a series of memes on LinkedIn <laughs> called Marketing Ops Life Told Via Stock Photo. So uh, I think you posted early enough in the day where when I wake up Pacific time, uh, it's one of the first things in my feed on, on LinkedIn in the morning. So pretty good stuff. Go check out Daryl on LinkedIn if you haven't already and if you want some laughs on a Friday. And um, the other thing Daryl's involved in is... Uh, he recently launched a new marketing operations course. Uh, Daryl, do you want to share a bit about that as we're getting underway here? I think it might be relevant to the ops folks that are listening to us here today. Yeah, and thanks for mentioning that. I'll try to keep it quick. You know, I think that that uh, marketing operations is still ambiguous for so many people. We don't really know what it means or what we should study. So I wanted to formally put something together, uh, a number of frameworks and sort of best practices on what a marketing operations professional should do to drive impact within their organization. And um, it is an eight week course that is a, a mix of on demand and live sessions. And uh, the first cohort starts this month. So just so, so in a couple of weeks, I'm really excited about it. Hopefully it's something that will run again um, in the future. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, thanks for letting me uh, talk about it. Absolutely. And where can uh, folks find out about that or sign up? Um, so you can go to martechalliance.com, which is the which is the company that I partnered with. Uh, you can also check it out on my LinkedIn profile. Super. Awesome. Well, let's get right into it because there's something you said when we talked before we started recording that I thought was super interesting. You said uh, Re RevOps, the role of operations, RevOps, marketing ops, sales ops, they're supposed to be strategic players and not just order takers. And um, I'd love to know, drill down a little bit. What did you mean by that, and why do you believe? Why do you believe in that statement? Yeah. So you know, I almost see it as a personal mission to elevate the role of marketing operations and operations in general. I think that you know, just naturally and historically, uh, operations folks have been the executors we've i've heard them referred to as button pushers and you know it's kind of like whatever at the whim of marketing and sales folks you know that them being the stars of the show um you know and 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 ops folks are sort of like at at their their beck and call and and be behind the scenes um but the more and more that i worked with really smart ops folks and i applied you know certain things in in into my own work I found that operations can really take a strategic role and be a big kind of differentiator um, for for the business. And um, there's a couple of reasons for that, which you know, you know I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to dive into. But yeah. but on the surface level, um, the the idea is rather than you know just building processes and systems and uh, trying to make lives easier for your stakeholders. It's better to think about an organization's business goals as a whole and how you can, with technology, people and processes support those goals. Um, that's the way that you become a strategic advisor and start to inform the higher level strategy uh, of a business. Yeah, that, ma that makes a ton of sense. And I think there's definitely a shift happening, um, like you said, from RevOps being uh, somebody who's just maybe administrating, uh, supporting sales uh, and uh, supporting campaigns on the marketing operations side to being a central uh, part of the company. And that's really what they should be viewed as. Uh, you said there were a couple areas that you uh, felt particularly strong about this. And what were those? So I think I think there's a couple of things. First, 
I think Ops has a nice bird's eye view or can have a nice bird's eye view of the business, of the go to market strategy and of the goals um, and can provide really special insight. Um, and then secondly, um, I think that operations, once you've found that sort of secret sauce or you've unlocked a lot of the things that bring sort of that drive revenue for the business, you can put those into practice in a repeatable and scalable way for long-term success. So let me break those down just a little bit. Um, if you are in the former sort of category where you're, you're only thinking about taking orders and you're only thinking about close up in the weeds, what salespeople or what marketing people are struggling with, you know, you're more of like a firefighter, you know, uh, uh, doing one off sort of tasks, you know, like, hey, um, this lead is coming in without their w without their lead source or, um, you know, this data is corrupted or our landing pages are broken. You know, you're you're mostly what you're doing is you're fighting the symptoms and that's a never ending game that you'll just kind of play for the rest of your time at, at that job. Um, but when you, but when you think about it from the bird's eye view, uh, uh, from, from the, from the sense of, do we have the right people, uh, technology and processes in place and systems in place, um, to support revenue and to support, you know, the, the go to market, uh, function in a, in a, in a, in a effective way. Um, that I think, that I think is, is where the real, um, sort of value comes from, from operations. Um, so, and, and, it, and, and often re requires you to take a step back, um, a, as you know, and, and look at what's the overall data strategy of the business. Um, how are campaigns created? You know, is there a sort of a center, center of excellence that we can govern and, and, and roll out to, to, to our stakeholders that they use so they can succeed every time? Um, so, so, so thinking like that in a strategic way, um, it, it is what I mean by, by, um, you know, moving from, from order taker to strategic advisor. And then, and then that leads directly to the other point, which is repeatability and then scalability. I think a lot of people, a lot of ops folks and, and a lot of marketing teams for sure are like reinventing the re the wheel every time, um, they, they try to come up with a campaign or they try to come up with some sort of new strategy to drive customer engagement. You know what I mean? Um, but in reality, a lot of these things don't really change. You know, uh, uh, um, it, w when you think about marketing, for example, um, marketing always has some sort of message, content, or offer. They always have a channel, and then they always have some sort of, you know, call to action, right? Some sort of conversion point. Those don't really change too much. Um, I think from a strategic standpoint, you can you can mess with the messaging and the branding. Um, but if you have a winning formula, templatizing that and putting together a process where you can whip those together really quickly, um, and and then you can you can start to multiply that and 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 expand that to different regional offices. Um, that's a real winner. You know what I mean? Rather than every quarter you're starting from scratch, uh, you have a blank piece of paper and you're like, okay, what are we going to do this quarter? And I think that, that too often teams, both sales and marketing teams are kind of starting from scratch every time, um, rather than, uh, relying on tried and true processes and things that could be easily templatized, um, um, that we know work. Um, and I think that that's another area that ops folks can really provide strategic value. Certainly. I, I almost think there's a, another step involved too, along with the people, processes and systems that maybe even comes before that. I'm curious if you could speak to this. I think it's before you even launch the campaign, before you even set up the landing pages and call to actions and all that stuff, you really need to determine what are the data points that we need to capture from this campaign to be able to even determine if it's working or not. And so there's almost a, a modeling, a data modeling activity that you have to undergo before you even put the process, put the technology together. Uh, who, who owns that or who should own that in your opinion? Is it RevOps or is it somebody else in the business? Um, 
So I think that's a good question. I think you do have to have a data model um, in place that's agreed upon um, across multiple organizations or uh, across multiple departments. And, you know, what I mean by that is, you know, when you're capturing custom, uh, prospect information in the form of a lead or you're getting it from some sort of other source, like salespeople are entering it, uh-huh. um, there should be a consistent um, standardized form that format that that comes in um, just so that you can operationalize that amongst your teams, you know, because if you don't know what territory a lead is in, if you don't know what industry they're in, if you don't know what their job title or what their pain points even could be, um, you're kind of a, a step behind. You know, first you can't route it to the right salespeople. They, you know, which one, which, which sales team has it? We don't know. Um, is it strategic accounts or is it SMB accounts? Um, and then the salespeople don't have the intelligence to, um, arm, aren't armed with the intelligence to have really sort of relevant conversations with those folks. They're just kind of guessing. Um, and who owns that? I think it's something that's agreed upon across multiple multiple departments. So, I, and, and one of the reasons why revenue ops in general is become, becoming really popular or really trendy in, uh, you know, in our space now is because that alignment uh, makes it really easy for those teams to get together and, you know, agree upon those definitions. So um, I think it definitely needs to be a shared model that uh, both sales, marketing, revenue ops, if they're all reporting to the same place, um, agree upon. And, um, it's incredibly important. I'm glad you mentioned alignment from where you sit in a marketing ops role. And you're at a huge organization, obviously some companies, uh, they just have rev ops and they handle everything across sales and marketing and CS. Other companies have separate CS sales ops, marketing ops, maybe even other ops teams involved, but you're in marketing ops and you run marketing ops. So t- talk about how you can become, uh, aligned with sales ops and what that looks like at a larger or more mature organization? Um, so, you know, that's a good question because, uh, I was formerly at a much smaller organization, maybe about 500 people, um, compared to now where, where, you know, um, you know, the tens and thousands of people. Um, so it becomes, it becomes that much harder, I think, to, to, to ensure alignment. Um, or it can be much harder. And I think at, at AWS, it's, it's, um, we have the benefit of leadership principles, which keeps us all aligned. And then we're a very data driven and we're very rigor, we're rigorously transparent around reporting and what our goals are, you know? So our goals are actually determined, um, twice a year. Um, so they're they're created they're created once and then refined um, in the second half of the year, and um, that is transparent and reported all the way up um, to the CEO to the C level. Um, so that's that's one side. We we can all collectively agree on what everyone's working on, and then the second is a very um, disciplined approach to reporting. Um, so we do something called the WBR, which is weekly business report. Uh And that is where all groups, uh, report up to leadership, um, what their key metrics are. Um, so, so for like the sales organization, it would be, um, leads, uh, meetings, conversions, um, opportunities, um, pipeline and revenue. And then for marketing, we have our, um, leads, MQLs, um, um, marketing influenced and generated opportunities, um, revenue. And then we have a, you know, a, a, a multi-touch attribution model, um, where we can kind of get a sense of, uh, uh, of influence across, across pipeline and across revenue. We also track something called, um, product and service adoptions, which is, you know, kind of like signing up for, for, uh, a, a new service. We have, over 175 different products and services uh, under the AWS umbrella. So you can imagine it's kind of, it's pretty complicated. Um, However, by being sort of committed um, and accountable for metrics on a weekly basis, and I was really surprised when we, when, 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 when we, when I came to AWS and, and Amazon in general works like this, 
um, to have to report that frequently and that deeply um, is an effort. It's an undertaking, but it's very worth it because, first of all, leadership is seeing that. And then you also, because you're accountable to reports, you know, it's almost like, hey, if you're if you're like working out or if you're if you're like on a diet program. And, and you're starting to keep track of, hey, how many push-ups did I do on Monday? You know, how many squats did I do on Tuesday? You immediately get better just beca- just from the practice of reporting. So I find that, that that transparency and that accountability is really key to alignment. Hmm. That, that's pretty interesting. And um, what, one of the things that you said, just to tie this thing up, is that uh, the best organizations treat up ops like a, like a business partner. And, um, and you know, for people who might be stuck feeling like they're there to serve and they're stuck chain, making small changes in the CRM or, uh, trying to help salespeople with emergency requests at the end of the quarter. And, and that's just the daily grind for them. And they're frustrated by that. What are the one or two things you would tell them to do right away to step out of and kind of break out of that mold and start stepping into more of a strategic uh, role at really elevating the ops position for themselves. Well, yeah. And, and, and that, that's a great question. And, you know, related to that, I just want to say that, you know, you might follow Dave Gearhart, who's the CMO of privy. Of course. Um, he, big fan. He, yeah. Big fan. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. And he, he essentially said on one of his like latest podcasts was if he would start, if he could start all over again, his first hire, first or second hire would be an ops person. Um, because of some of those things that I mentioned, the repeatability, scalability, um, and then the process and, and, and the key part to ops. And one of the things, the number one things that they should be doing is connecting marketing to revenue. Um, and it, and it takes, you know, it it can't be someone's sort of side priority or hobby to do that. You need to do it from the beginning. You need Mm. to think about it from the beginning and that, that sets you on the right track. Um, and then what what gave Dave Gerhardt was mentioning was that a lot of marketing teams, revenue teams even, will put their go-to-market function to work, sales and marketing efforts, start creating campaigns, start running sales plays, but they're not really tracking what the impact is to revenue, and they scramble later on to try to connect those things together, and they find it's a lot harder than they think, you know, because of the data model that we talked about, because of the discipline it takes, mm-hmm. uh, the sales and marketing alignment that it takes. Um, to make sure that you're capturing the right data and converting opportunities the right way. Um, so, so that's why it's so important to, to think about ops as a strategic partner from the beginning. Um, so you've got revenue and reporting, I think, is, is, the, is, is the first one that you really have to think about. I think about um, um, center of excellence, I think, is, 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 a, is, a, is another key thing. That, yeah, you mentioned that. that. Uh, Tell me more I, about that. Yeah, sure. So, so the easiest way to think about a center of excellence are centralized programs, campaigns, and processes that people across the organization can use again and again. And the easiest way to think about it is, like, from a marketing operations standpoint, are sort of campaigns. So you're never building a webinar or a live event from scratch. You're never building a drip campaign from scratch. You're never building a newsletter from scratch. There's a set of templates that everyone has sort of agreed upon and leadership has sort of, of, of get, have oversight for that is the best of the best. And then when you use that, you're automatically leveraging the best practices of everything that everyone's learned in the past. Mm. And the cool thing about this is as you get those campaigns out to market, um, operations sees what impact they're having and then makes adjustments to the templates in the center of excellence so that everyone benefits from the learnings, you know, because that's another big problem, right? If you have the larger and larger your team, the learnings become decentralized. So what happens is, oh, people in North America are doing great. They're doing great, uh, you know, email nurture campaigns. Um, And, you know, the team in EMEA, in Europe is doing great live events, um, but they're not learning from each other. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not, you know, they, 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 
are doing poorly on the other areas. But from a centralized ops perspective, we can take the learnings from EMEA, we take the learnings from, from Namer, and then we put them into the center of excellence so that every time that they use these sort of you know, programs, they're already benefiting from all of those learnings. Um, so I think the center of excellence is, is, definitely, is definitely a key one that I would, I, would, I would probably go to as well. Yeah, so it's not only like program best practices or proven templates, uh, but does it also include, you mentioned drip campaigns and workflows and things like that. So those things are already pre-built and I'm sure there's a bunch of hidden fields or custom things on there to make sure that anytime something new is created, um, the same, the proper data is being captured and it's going to flow properly through your systems. Is that also part of it? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I think that, that, and that stuff a lot of times is, it's either taken for granted with people that have been doing this for a while. So like I will, um, just sort of naturally think that a lot of this data, you know, UTM parameters, mm-hmm. um, lead source tagging, all of this stuff, I'll automatically just assume that it's taking place, but that's because, you know, I've been working with teams and with my team for a long time. And that those, those things I think are bread and butter for us, you know, but I forget that for a lot of other, other people, especially when you're just getting started, you forget about all of that data model, um, um, you know, uh, requirements, um, when, when you're putting together your strategy and, 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 and what you end up with is you have a bunch of leads in your database with no lead source. You don't know where they come, came from. They're incomplete. Right. Um, so it, it absolutely has to happen. Um, you know, and I, and I think that that's that making sure that that happens is, is a, is an entirely, um, you know, is an entirely sort of different topic in general. Um, but it, it absolutely is, is, is key to, to make sure that, that those stuff are in place. If it's not, then you just spend up, end up spending hours trying to rationalize everything. When, if you just put the proper infrastructure in the place, in place in the first place, uh, you'd save so much time. Uh, but a lot of small, co- smaller companies without your scale, uh, they're under so much pressure to grow. Right. And so they're yeah. going, they're trying to get stuff out to market. They're trying to get new campaigns up. Um, on both the sales and the marketing side and, and that stuff gets left on the sidelines, but hopefully not for too much longer because of, of people like you who are bringing these ideas to the forefront. Uh, one last question on, you mentioned you guys have weekly business reviews, WBRs, I think you said. Hmm. So, um, your role, what, what's the breakup between reporting and, um, tactical stuff, tactical stuff, and then more strategic stuff. So I, and you can converge those however you want, but like, I, I want to know about your breakup on a, on a month to month or week to week basis of where you spend your time. So I think the easiest way to think of my team is we own, um, the marketing technology that, um, you know, over a thousand marketers use to create digital experiences for our customers. So, um, the I, I think that that sort of encompasses a variety of different um, sort of things. And then and then our, our team is broken up into like four different parts, which is engineering. So we actually build internal um, products for our marketers. So, you know, and, and uh, not every company has the luxury of doing that, but we can build our own custom MarTech, to, to be honest. Um, we have an analytic, we have an, an analytics team that focuses specifically on the reporting that you talked about. So it, which is, which is, uh, supporting the weekly and monthly reports okay. and then trying to drive insights from that. Um, there's enablement side, which, uh, focuses on the training of stakeholders and then sort of the gov- governance and support of all those people, since there's so many, um, and then, and then heavy, like what you would normally think of as operations. And these are people that are building the center of excellence, um, building the center of excellence, making, uh, focusing on data management. Um, so our ops team is actually broken up into four different teams. Let's go through that again, because I think that's really key for people who aren't at, at a mature stage, like Amazon web services. Uh, what are these four, uh, 
parts of ops because these are the parts that you're going to have to build when you go from single rev ops, uh, do it all, jack of all trades person to um, a more mature team. So let's hit those again. Yeah, sure. So we have marketing engineering. So these are developers and product managers that build things specifically for marketing. And then you have business intelligence and analytics. And they focus on supporting the reporting structure as well as trying to pull insights to improve um, our marketing in general. Uh -huh. um, and then just, you know, just, just their, their whole job is analytics. And then, so, so you might think of them as maybe analysts, data scientists, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And then we have um, enablement, which is broken up into training, support, and governance, or their main focus is our training, support, and governance. So teaching people how to use the different platforms, ensuring they're using it the right way, and then helping them consulting when, ne when, when needed. Um, and then you have your traditional, what we kind of really think of as heavy operations um, or, st or, or traditional operations, which focuses on um, platform. It's more of platform administration. Uh -huh. um, so what's a good way to think about it? Tech, um, tech if you have admins? A, yeah, if, yeah. At your company, you might have a Marketo or Pardot admin uh -huh. or a HubSpot admin. Uh -huh. That's the that's that's platform operations. What you traditionally would think of as platform operations, and they do things like create the center of excellence, the architecture of the system in, itself. Um, what else? Um, data management, the center of excellence. So kind of yeah, what you would normally think of, I think, when you think of of a marketing automation administrator. Yeah, yeah, okay, that makes a ton of sense. And and you also uh, are not only creating experiences for, um, you know, you're not only running RevOps to create good experiences for your external customers, but you're doing this internally as well. I think you alluded to it with the, um, the team that builds products internally. But tell us about the, um, how you guys focus both internally and externally in, in your role in ops. Yeah. So, so, you know, I have this, I have this concept that I've been thinking about a lot and it is, you can drive impact with operations by reducing friction and you can reduce friction for both your internal and external customers. Um, I want to talk about external first because I think a lot of companies really need to think customer first. And if you do that, you're not going to be led astray. Um, so think about the buyer experience, whether, you know, what they're seeing on your website or your landing pages, can you reduce the number of fields on your form? Can you make your landing pages or your pages more intuitive? So we're talking about UX, right? Um, um, user experience, uh, user experience design, um, and can they get the information that they need quickly, whether it's from a salesperson or from a chat bot or from, you know, a, a product sheet that they download, those things, there's friction in between all those areas, and removing that really helps. Um, and then once, you, once you've thought about how to remove friction for your external customers, then you can start to think about removing friction for your internal stakeholders. That's your sales and marketing or your, 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 your go-to-market teams. Um, and for me, it's really you know, helping them do their jobs better, right? Um, does a salesperson is a salesperson armed with the intelligence they need to have a good conversation with a prospect uh, when they're converting a lead in the CRM? Is it easy or does it take like 10 different, you know, toggles and, and field that you have to fill out in order to convert Validation. a lead to an opportunity? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, so there's friction there. Um, there's also friction when they're trying to get reports. You know, if they want to see a report of everybody who attended an event, can they do it or do they have to wait two days? You know what I mean? Um, and then they get stale. So, so, so that's on the sales side. And for marketers, you know, how long does it take them to create an event, right? Um, or like a webinar. Um, and, if, and if they're good quality webinars, if it takes them 10 hours to create a webinar, um, you know, that's a long time. And it limits the amount of productivity that they can do uh, across the quarter. You know, if you can take that down from 10 hours to five hours, you've essentially given them the opportunity to double what they've been doing. Yeah. So 
you know, theoretically, if one webinar produces 100 sales ready leads and sales conversations, they can do now do two. So that's now 200. So, so, uh, you know, it all comes back to whoever your customer is trying to th- put yourself in their shoes, go through their day to day, and then try to remove the friction from each spot. And I think that that's a great way to, to drive impact with operations. And then do it internally as well. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you, I think you could take the concept and c- continue to apply that no matter what you're doing. You can apply it to yourself, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like as a, if, um, you know, uh, um, we have, you know, our, our work is very project based, you know, uh, implement a new tool, um, create a new process for marketers or for marketers, um, invest, in, implement a new, um, you know, data hygiene project. Um, if, if you templatize it and, and you have everything that you need when you, when you first start, rather than having to reinvent the wheel each time, it, it makes it easier on yourself. You know what I mean? Um, and yeah. I, I, I try to think about that a lot too, as I, as I, you know, personally, as I, as I do work too. Continuing on this run of, uh, discussing friction, uh, thinking about maybe, maybe not only at AWS, but also at previous jobs. And I know you're involved with Sincari too. So, um, thinking about these different companies you've been involved with, what are the common areas of friction that you see spe- specifically internally, um, that companies need to watch out for that they may not even know that these areas of friction are happening, but they're happening and it's really killing productivity. You mentioned a couple, any others that come to mind? I think that, you know, and then I think you, you kind of set it up perfectly talking about Sincari and I've been an advisor for them for since pretty much their inception. Um, it is the, the idea that the, that data is different siloed and in different formats across different systems. And, and that is a really yeah. big challenge. Um, so, so, and, and I think that that's been letting, led to the, you know, popularization of the CDP or customer data platform. Um, just because you have your CRM data, it may or may not match what's in your marketing automation platform. It may be different from, you know, whatever proprietary, um, database that, that, that stores your customer information and your customer data, and they all need to come together to create a good customer experience, whether that's marketing, you know, because you want to send uh, personalized, relevant communications and sort of experiences to them, or it could be from a customer success perspective even, you know what I mean? Like if you want, if you want to send them helpful guides or be alerted, um, um, you know, when they sort of fall into sort of a dangerous, um, churn sort of zone, um, it all starts with data. If you don't have the data, then, 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 then you're kind of, you're, you're a step behind. Um, so, so there's companies like Sincari that, um, really focus on synchronizing that data across the, all the systems, um, cleaning it up and making it actionable and usable. Um, you know, no matter what your role is, I think is really important. Um, at, at, at AWS, we, we are fortunate to have, uh, data engineers and specialists that really focus on synchronizing the data across different platforms. Um, you know, but even if you are a smaller company with, 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 without the resources, I think that, that just by having that idea that the data should be the same in different places and that they sh- it should be actionable can, can be a great, you, you can really drive some efficiencies, um, by removing that sort of friction there. Mm-hmm. So data silos, that's a big one you mentioned. Um, and that's a big one across the go to market and uh, post sale, um, cycle. And then there's also, you mentioned making things easier for salespeople as they're going through their day to day, um, and not having to, uh, follow through on too many validations when they're trying to convert an opportunity or whatever. Uh, so that's salesperson efficiency. Any, any others? I know those are two major areas of friction that every company we talk to struggles with. Any others that come to top of mind? Um, you know, I think, I think that for internal teams, there's a lot of little ones. I think, I think the major ones that companies need to focus on is, is, the friction for the customer, you know, and I know I talked about that a lot, but I think, I still think it's, it's a pervasive problem in the industry. 
where people can't get the information that they need um, to make a buying decision. Yeah. Um, you're probably familiar with the whole argument of pre-qualifying people before they can even do a demo and like that whole sort of different schools of thought there. Sure. I think a lot of work needs to be done for companies to think buyer first. Um, and if that means being transparent, more transparent, then I think that that's what it means. Um, and then, you know, I think, I, th I think having, having AI and chatbots, um, you know, help with that. Um, and then, and then I think, I think it's just having a customer lens when putting together whatever your go to market experience looks like it, it is so key, you know, because I, I, I come across a lot of, you know, company websites or a lot of tools and you come onto the website and you just don't know what they do or what they can do for you. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? And, you know, there's some companies that I suppose can have an out, right? So if you go to like a major software player, then you've got like 20 different things that they could do and they're all different industries. So it's like, okay, maybe, so, so they may, can maybe lead. it's fine. So they can, <laughs> yeah, they can lead with their like, uh, jazzy, like brand headline, you know, in, in exactly. the top of their website, they don't actually need to tell you what they do because you know. But for everyone else, when yeah. you come across their site, like they need to tell, they need to explain what pain point they're solving for you and what that future state looks like if you do business with them. And I think that that's, there's a lot of things lacking. I'm not going to name in any names or anything, but that's what I'm seeing as, as sort of that idea of friction throughout yeah. the, the industry. Yeah. Look, I can learn from that. You, you just look at a website and ask yourself that question. What's the customer experience when they come here? Can they get access to your product or do they have to fill out a form or do they have to talk to sales? Um, can they understand what, what, uh, you're going to help them solve and so many other things that, um, a lot of websites leave out in favor of design or what else? I mean, there's a bunch of crap on websites that aren't even helpful in explaining what a company does and how they can help. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I, this is the last point I'll make on this and everyone uses this example, but like, as long as you, you hold this in your mind, like if you go to zoom, right. Or, um, you know, like zoom's a great example. You want to host a meeting and you just do it. You know what I mean? There's no, there's zero friction, right? You go to the website and whether you have an account or not, you, 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 get, you start a meeting. Um, so, so use that as a baseline. <laughs> you know, I, I go to a website and immediately I'm solving the problem that I have in my mind. Um, now not everyone is zoom and not everyone has, you know, a price point that you can pay for monthly off your credit card. Um, but if you keep that idea in mind of what the customer wants and try to deliver that as soon as possible and as frictionless as possible, um, you, I, I think you'll, you'll drive impact within your organization. I love that. Uh, Daryl, last question for you. Uh, a huge part of ops is change management. You, and I don't know, um, it seems like people people in ops are just starting to recognize this and make this a big priority. I just got off the phone with Asia Corbett. I'm not sure if you know Asia. She just joined Rev Genius. Yeah, um, yeah, she's yeah. in, uh, she's in Rev Ops and she was talking about how, how she learned very early on that you can't just roll out something new in the CRM or roll out a new process or automation and expect people to just accept it, accept that that change happened and that, and that they understand you have to actually go and explain it to them, help them understand why, why, why it was done and how it can help them. And, um, that's, uh, change management. So tell me about your experience with change management and why you feel it's so key in an ops position. Yeah. And, you know, I have so much to say about this, but I will say, I will, I will keep it to two key points. There's change management, you know, how you roll it out and how you, how you implement it. And then there's when you come across problems with change management. So I think, first of all, change management, change management is so important because without people, the change doesn't happen. So you need a people first approach. And that starts with um, documentation, uh, communication. And I, I actually say it, it starts with over communication. Um, so, so documenting the entire 
process change. So let's say let's say you're implementing a new process or tool, having that documented and having the why documented so people understand why we're doing it and what to expect and what's expected of them in a very simple and clear way is super important. Um, because especially as your organization grows, you can't meet with everybody one-on-one. A lot of people will just know you from your emails that go to a thousand people, right? So that, so that written form is really important. And then the second is over communication. And even at smaller organizations, everyone's super busy. So, so you need to be communicating with people frequently on different modalities in different mediums. I mean, whether it's live trainings, um, email newsletters, um, one-on-one conversations, recorded videos, whatever, what, 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 what have you. Um, and when you, f- I, I find that a good indication of, of that you're doing a good job with communication is that once a change is rolled out, no one's like throwing up arms about, oh, this is a new big change. So, so that's like a really quick primer on how to do it right. Now, th- something that I've been thinking about really personally is what happens when they don't agree with the why or they don't they think they know how to do something better or they think a different approach is better and that's something that a lot of the books a lot of the you know business books don't cover is like when when everyone completely disagrees with you and how do you manage change and you know this is this has been a personal experience that I've had recently where my team rolled out uh, um, you know, a QA process change that really kind of up-leveled and held our marketers to a higher standard of campaign building. Huh. But when you do that, when you raise the quality of something, um, it tends to make people slow down a little bit, you know? And that was the part that I think a lot of people really struggled with. Um, you know, you try telling someone that they need to slow down when they have big goals to do. Especially and I think that, sales and marketing people who are you know, impatient by nature. I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Even I, like, like if it was something else, I would probably be upset or frustrated. Um, so, so what happens when people, regardless of how many times you communicate it, don't agree with you? Um, there's a couple things. One is you need to hear them out and have like this open sort of forum to have them express their concerns and try to address them as best as you can. Um, So at least including them and including their input in the process is key because you need them at eventually to disagree and commit, which means even though they don't agree, they need to do it. So that's one thing. And the second thing is to get really, really clear about your purpose and your mission when you're trying to manage change. And for me, that mission was I wanted to create a better experience for our end customers in the long run. And I, and I wanted that to, to, to happen regardless of organizational change, regardless of what happened tomorrow. I wanted something in place that I knew would kind of stand the test of time, if you will. Like three, four years later, this step that we implemented today would still be in place and it would still like raise the bar for our customers in terms of, of terms of experience. And I really believed that. And that helped me power through these honestly very uncomfortable conversations. And you need that. Otherwise, if you don't, if you're not clear about your mission and your purpose, um, you may just give in. You know what I mean? You may just say like, oh, fine, you don't have to do it or Maybe this was a bad idea. You know, you start doubting yourself. Yeah. Um, so that, that would be, th- those are my recommendations, you know, for change management is manage the rollout, over communicate. And then when, t- when times get tough, you have to really be clear about your mission. Um, and that'll see you through sort of the, the tougher parts of change management. I feel like we could have an episode just on change management and, uh, and it, we could talk for 45 minutes on that, but, uh, I feel like we have to cut it off. Uh, We've been talking for quite a while now. Uh, There's been just super, super content in here, Daryl. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, Honored to have you and uh, best of luck with uh, everything you've got going on. You're a busy man. So um, uh, best of luck. Have a great summer and we hope to catch up soon. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Dan. Absolutely. Thanks for coming.